Hey, do you remember this? Or how about this? Or even this? Do you remember these games? Of course you do. They're some of the best games of the last 20 plus years. And they were all made by one company. A company that has a legendary status when it comes to creating incredible stories and games, mixed in with pushing the boundaries of game design that influences how video games are being developed today. And that company is Valve. But Valve has changed a lot in the last seven years or so. They've gone from creating games that fans know and love to becoming the biggest online store for PC games, Steam. And even though they still release some games, like that card game they announced that nobody really wanted, they haven't gone back to the games that brought them into the spotlight in the first place. This video isn't going to be speculation on whether Valve is making Left 4 Dead 3 or is finally going to release Half-Life 3. I want to focus mostly on their older games and how they've changed the video game industry forever. So let's take a look at the first game that Valve ever released, and that game was Half-Life. Half-Life was released in 1998, two years after I was born, so I didn't get a chance to play it until much later in my life. And when I did, it wasn't even the original version made by Valve, it was a fan remake of Black Mesa that was my first experience into the world of Half-Life. Now before you go angrily quitting out of this video, I have gone back and played the original, and it still holds up to this day. Back in 1998, Half-Life was like nothing anyone had ever seen before. While most first-person shooters in that time had players going around endless mazes, collecting coloured keycards on specific doors, Half-Life was almost a first-person shooter mixed in with a puzzle game, forcing the player to use the environment around them to traverse the facility of Black Mesa. It was unprecedented in the world of video games, and showed that games could be creative in both their storytelling and their gameplay design, and also made a theoretical physicist with a crowbar seem very cool. It comes no surprise that Valve then planned to release expansions for Half-Life, the main ones being Opposing Force and Blue Shift, which were both developed alongside Gearbox Software. You know, those guys that made the Borderlands games? Yeah, those guys. But as well as being an amazing game, Half-Life is extremely moddable, and fans all around the world were using the Half-Life engine to create their own games. But one game stuck out amongst the rest that caught the attention of the guys at Valve. That game was Counter-Strike. Interestingly, the developers of Counter-Strike were hired by Valve soon after, and the game was released in 1999. Counter-Strike has had a slew of different releases from Counter-Strike Source to Counter-Strike Global Offensive, and the game has become one of the biggest eSports competitions in the world. But another multiplayer game was released by Valve, that being Team Fortress Classic, which was again originally a mod called Team Fortress from the popular game Quake, which was developed by id Software, the same guys that developed this. Than this. While I've never played the original Team Fortress or Team Fortress Classic, the series would go on to produce one of the most popular multiplayer games of all time, Team Fortress 2, but more on that later. While Valve would go on to release games like Day of Defeat, Half Life Source, and Gary's Mod, one of their biggest games was on the horizon, a game that had been in development for about four years, as one of Valve's most anticipated titles, and that game was Half Life 2. Rise and shine, Mr. Freeman. Rise and shine. Half-Life 2 was an immediate success for Valve. Not only was it a direct sequel to Half-Life, one of the best FPS games ever, it also showed that Valve were pioneers when it comes to gameplay design. Half-Life 2 had something that other games didn't, an interactive environment. This was something that hadn't really been done in a video game. Players were able to manipulate objects by picking them up and throwing them around using the aptly named Gravity Gun. Players can now use objects to throw at enemies or use them to traverse the levels. It made for an interesting game mechanic that we are still seeing the influence of today in games like Deus Ex and Prey. But not only was the gameplay improved, Valve was set up their game on the way they told Half-Life 2's story. Yes, the narrative was still given to the player through character dialogue and the environment around the player instead of using cutscenes, but Valve had improved on the face and body animations of every character. They all seemed full of life and actually looked like you were talking to a real person. Like, goddamn, look at this, look how pretty it is. Half-Life 2 would actually have two add-ons. These were two extra episodes that actually continued Half-Life 2's story, unlike Opposing Force and Blue Shift in the original Half-Life which were separate stories inside the events of Black Mesa and, as previously mentioned, developed by Gearbox Software. Instead, these two new episodes would be developed internally at Valve. These two episodes meant more time for players to explore the world of Half-Life, but it wasn't going to last. Episode 2 ended with a massive cliffhanger. 
and at that time players didn't know it yet, but we would never see what would happen to Gordon Freeman and his friends. We would never see Half-Life 2, Episode 3. Gabe Newell, head of Valve, continually evaded questions about Half-Life 2, Episode 3's existence for a long time, until he eventually stopped answering questions about it at all. The only respite we got was from Mark Laidlaw, the head writer for the Half-Life series. He published a post on his blog called Epistle 3, which was an unofficial script for Half-Life 2, Episode 3's plot and ending. The blog post is bittersweet, but if you want to read it for yourself, if you haven't already, I'll link it in the description. It is an ending though, and I think it's what many players around the world needed, a definitive ending. But that's enough about Half-Life 2. While Valve have been busy developing Episode 2, they're also developing two new games, one being a sequel to an older Valve title, and another was to be a brand new IP. Both of these were of course Portal and Team Fortress 2. Interestingly, both these games will be released in a bundle together alongside Half-Life 2 and Half-Life 2 Episode 1 and Episode 2. This bundle was called the Orange Box. This was the first time anyone got their hands on Portal, and just like every game Valve had released beforehand, it blew everyone away. Portal had you playing as Shell, a silent protagonist must use the Portal gun to escape the Aperture Science Laboratory, it's under the control of the AI GLaDOS. In typical Valve fashion, the Portal gun was an amazing game mechanic that led to some incredibly interesting puzzles for the player to solve. Interestingly, the events of Portal actually take place right before the events of the first Half-Life, meaning that both games exist in the same universe. Valve actually released a comic that bridges the gap between Portal and Portal 2, showing that the Combine invasion of Earth at the end of Half-Life was the reason why the Aperture facility was abandoned in the first place. The final game that was included in the Orange Box was Team Fortress 2, a team-based shooter in which players pick specific roles to play throughout each match. Each character has a unique personality and abilities, it's no wonder that it's still one of the most popular multiplayer games to date. It also paved the way for other multiplayer shooters such as Blizzard's Overwatch, which you can see is heavily inspired by TF2, showing that once again Valve are pioneers when it comes to game design and setting trends. The Orange Box is, to this day, still one of the best game bundles ever to be released. Even though TF2 is now free to play, it's still worth picking up just to play Half-Life 2 and Portal. But even when we didn't think that Valve could release anything better than Half-Life 2 and Portal, they came out with this. I think it's safe to say that you would have at least played Left 4 Dead at some point in your life. It's a game that many other companies and developers have tried to replicate over the years, the main one being this year's World War Z, which takes heavy inspiration from Left 4 Dead. Left 4 Dead is players playing as a group of survivors in a zombie apocalypse. You must use a variety of different weapons to make your way through hordes of zombies to safety. What was unique about Left 4 Dead was the variety of zombies you could come across. There was the Boomer, the Jockey, the Charger, the Tank, the Spitter, and of course, the Witch. Each zombie could deal damage to the players in different ways. This made for extremely interesting gameplay in which players had to work together to make their way through levels. It comes no surprise that Valve doubled down on Left 4 Dead, releasing Left 4 Dead 2 only a year later in 2009. Left 4 Dead 2 was an instant hit like its predecessor, but it came under heavy fire for its graphic content. Here in Australia, the government flat out refused to rate the game if the graphic content wasn't censored in some way, which Valve did do. And it wasn't until 2017 that it became uncensored when Australia had its first R18 Plus rating for video games. Left 4 Dead 2 was probably my most played zombie game, and occasionally I'll pick it up again with a friend of mine and play through the campaign. It's one of those games you can come back to and enjoy every now and then. But players have to wait two more years for another Valve title, and it was worth the wait. Portal 2 was again an instant hit for Valve. It improved on everything the original had done so well. It has an interesting story that has many plot twists the players just didn't see coming. Its puzzles had been improved to have more interesting outcomes, and it had multiplayer. Players could now go through a series of different puzzle rooms together, either helping each other or hindering instead. Players didn't know it yet, but the golden age of Valve games was coming to an end, and Portal 2 would be the last time we see one of Valve's original IPs. While they would go on to make Dota 2, Valve would never again make a first-person story-driven game. In fact, in the following years since Portal 2's release, Many veteran members of Valve began to leave the company, seeing that the state of creating single player experiences was at an end. Valve was doubling down on Steam, and that's no surprise. In 2017, Steam made 4.3 billion in sales. That's more money than any game, no matter how good it is, would ever make in a lifetime. But it's still bittersweet. 
Valve has been directly responsible for many of my happiest memories while playing their games, and I'm thankful for that. But there's still a part of me that wants to play a new Portal game, or shoot at zombies in a new Left 4 Dead, or even to see the end of Gordon Freeman's adventure. But I think the time for those games has passed. What would a Half-Life 3 look like in 2019? I don't think it would do nearly as well as anything else on the market. Look at Titanfall 2, one of the best first-person shooters in a long time. It didn't sell nearly as well as it should have, and it especially wouldn't make Valve $4.3 billion. But what I think we can do is remember the games that Valve has given us, for all the happiness and fun we've had playing their games. And for that, I'll always be grateful. Thank you, Valve.